What is accounting practice management software? Is it the operating system for your accounting practice? Is it an all-in-one software solution for accountants? Is it the crucial tech standing between your practice and utter chaos? Accounting practice management software should bring together all of your practice's mission-critical functions in one place to make your life and your practice easier. Stay tuned to hear more from our sponsor, Canopy, later in the episode. Apps are going to shut down. I, I truly believe this is going to happen. Wow. There's going to be issues because you don't have access to the API and, and just another thing, right, being turned off that you don't have control on as a firm. And it's these are the things that burn bridges. And then you wonder why accountants are like, I don't want to use desktop because nobody can turn it off once I buy it and install it on my hard drive. Right? Like that's this is the, our behaviors as an industry cause other people's behaviors as an industry. Coming to you weekly from the OnPay Recording Studio, this is the Cloud Accounting Podcast. Welcome to the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I'm Blake Oliver. And I'm David Leary. Blake, I get to see you in 48 hours, two days. That's right. That's right. We're going to be together at Scaling New Heights in Orlando. A little different than here. I mean, how hot, like, it got to Tucson. It was like 109 yesterday. It was ridiculous. And then we, it got... We get some clouds, but monsoons might be here. But how's yeah. Phoenix? Uh, One thirteen, something like that. I don't know. I I stay inside. I was looking at, at Orlando, and I think some of the temperatures were pushing the high nineties, and then the humidity of like eighty five percent. I'm like, I don't know. I'm gonna do this. We're gonna die. I'm excited to tell you, David, that my end of this podcast is now ESG compatible because I just got solar on my house. And if I have a solar tube, the light. My studio, we're, we're getting credits everywhere. Oh, you have a, what, like a, what do you mean solar tube? It's a hole in my roof. Oh, you, like a sunroof? Or a, uh, yeah, a, yeah, essentially. A skylight? Skylight, yeah. So that's how you light your office. Yeah. I see. Well, so, uh, you know, our ESG score has improved, I'm sure, for the podcast. Although I have to go find out from the utility uh, where the electricity is being produced so that I can factor that into our ESG score. I think on July 15th, the... Uh, we ordered a, in December one of those uh, Microsoft Maquis. I think I've talked about on the show before, and yeah. like I was, trying, I, I didn't want to break the the news, but to my wife. But I'm like, there's a high probability coals being used to make the electricity for the car you're going to drive. So I don't know, <laughs> like, like how good this is. Well, David, we got to get to the news, yes. and we're going to talk about app news first because we had some breaking news when it comes to two different apps that affect the accounting profession and our clients. We also have a voicemail from Byron Patrick, from Heather Smith. We got two reviews. Two reviews. Yep. Great. And a crazy, crazy clip from an interview with Senator Loomis, Cynthia Loomis, about crypto from a little while back that I heard on a Marketplace podcast that I just have to play for everybody because it just indicates the level of insanity we're at with crypto right now. And of course, we got to talk about the recent crypto crash. And you know, I got to say, David, I, we, we deserve some credit for our coverage of this because the whole time crypto is going up, you and I were that's true skeptical about it. And I think a lot of the problems that we highlighted have become very evident now that you know crypto is not a great store of value. I, I even took advice of so-called crypto experts that are out there that said, oh, the, the key is to buy low. So I bought on Monday and I've even lost money from that buy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bitcoin right now, as we record on Friday, June uh, 17th is like flirting with the $20,000 number and and you know if it goes below that psychologically that'll probably drive it even further down but yeah let's uh, let's talk about app news first so, right yeah first app news came in literally this morning through email and then saw it on twitter clear spend is another as one of those apps you know it's uh prepaid spending cards right? And you spend it, it's expense management. It's the whole stack that we've seen lots of apps like this. They were new, fairly coming to market. Their first conference was Accounting Web. What was that? Three weeks ago. They had the biggest booth at Accounting Web. They were really ready to make their big splash. And then this morning, some accountants are started sending emails that they're getting contacted by employees that said, we don't, we need to cancel our meeting we had for today. Clear spend is no more. So they've completely shut down. Yeah. Uh, here's an email from Adam Sessions who is like a channel partnership 
person at Clearspend, and this was forwarded to us by a listener. He said, hi, it is much. It is with much sadness to say this, but I felt you needed to know Clearspend is no more. I know it's a shock, and I wanted to reach out before they shut down our emails, so my personal email is blah, blah, blah. I want to say thank you for trusting in me and apologize for failing you. The parent company of Clearspend tried to raise more money than needed, and when the markets dropped, the evaluation, I think he meant valuation, dropped, and we were left with only a 90-day runway in short. So, you know, David, you then posted about how this is why accountants tend to be skeptical of new products and adoption tends to be kind of slow because we're, we've been burned before. This has happened. It's happened for yeah. a decade. It's happened so for forever. This is not just a startup thing, right? But accountants, like, could you imagine like you three weeks ago, you, you went to them at their booth, you get excited. You're like, Hey, I like this product. It's free. I have some clients it fits for you onboard them and it's going away. And this could happen with any mm-hmm. app, any company. Right. But Really, the lesson here is I, 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 it's not like shame on you startup type lesson. It's not that. It's it's not accountants and bookkeepers like, oh, you should be slow to adopt. It's like in your nature. I get it. But it's really for all the app developers and apps that are out there that all think they can get accountants. Like every time I meet a new app developer in some app, they think they're going to be the app that's going to crack the 24-month sales cycle to accountants and bookkeepers. But you can't do it because they have to make sure you're a real company. And yeah. this is the perfect example of this. It was really funny. I had a, at AICP Engage, I had a conversation with Accountants World, somebody from Accountants World. He does all their conference scene. I for, I, forgive me, I forgot his name. I know he's a listener. I apologize. But he, um, Iris now bought Accountants World, the Iris group out of the UK. And he said that we were just talking about how long it takes to sell. And he's like, yeah, he had an accountant that came to their booth last year who basically said, I've been watching your booth for six years. And he finally had the courage to come to visit them in the booth. Now, the problem is this doesn't reconcile with the VCs in the software industry because yeah. the VCs are going to give a company money because they want the company to double in size in six months. But it doesn't work for VCs and money and accounting and accountants and adoption of software. And it's like, yeah. maybe the slow and steady approach is the best approach here. For accounting, absolutely. And you have to understand the reason the sales cycle is long, it's it's not just because accountants are conservative by nature, it's it's because we have to vet the apps for our clients because the worst thing is when you recommend something to a client and then it disappears, yeah. right? And it, and it shuts down or they change strategy and that's really disruptive, especially when you've gone and put something in place with dozens of clients and then you have to go find a solution. It's hugely disruptive. So that's why we're, we're reluctant to just go with any brand new shiny thing. Not, not to mention for accounts in the sales cycle, your, your time's dictated by the tax year and deadlines, and there's all these other variables. And then on top yeah. of that, your clients are small businesses and they have their own schedule and variables. Like you just can't yeah. come in and be like, we're changing all your apps tomorrow. Like it's just, it's very, yeah. very hard to do. But this is, this is one of the main reasons people are very cautious. Like, so. and, and the other reason is that a lot of VC backed companies come into the accounting profession and they think we're just going to be a channel for them, that they're just going to sell to accountants, but they're not going to do anything special from a product standpoint. And that almost never works. If you are going to have a successful accountant program or partner program, first of all, don't call it a channel program because we're not a channel. We're not a sales channel. We are a partner to you. You have to also dedicate development resources because if we don't see you building stuff that we need as accountants, we're not going to invest our relationships in your- And it's business. resources on both sides. Yes, you need to invest in your product, but you have to you know, you know, have to go to the conferences, sponsor booths. You have to build a relationship with the accountants. It's not show up, yeah. here's the lead capture, we're going to convert you. But that- it's, a long, it's a long journey, <laughs> but it can be very rewarding as we saw, right? Uh, Bill.com, it took them 20 years and they did it and or something 10, like decade, half- decade, 10. A decade, Expensive yeah. Five, decade, decade, five, decade, decade, yeah. yeah. Half of their revenue at Bill.com, I don't know what it is for Expensify, but Bill.com, practically half of their revenue ended up coming through the accountant channel. Yeah. But it takes time. And so it when, takes a long when time. When did the clear spend that kind of, like in general, I do feel like there's a lot, every time you go to one of these conferences, there's another expense management app that's free. They're all using this kind of free yeah. model because they're trying to make money on the arbitrage or whatever. And so- The interchange, yeah. The interchange. So other apps that are out there, apparently were in the news this week as well, a competing app. Yes. So Brex- which started out as basically the same thing as ClearSpend. 
a credit card, virtual cards that you provision to your employees and also physical cards, right? Yes. A spend management platform, an alternative to getting an Amex corporate card. They have changed direction and they're shutting down this banking product they created. They're, so they're hundred percent shutting down the banking product. I thought they just kicked me off because I don't use it enough. I said it wrong. They're shutting it down for some users. So okay. they've decided to pivot. Well, here, here's the, the language, how they explained it. Okay. There's a article on their support site and the headline is, why am I no longer qualified to be a Brex customer? Brex is constantly evolving our business, and after changes to our strategy, we are less suited to meet the needs of smaller customers. And so the discussion online is Brex decided they can't be serving both small businesses and enterprise and mid-market. They've been trying to do too much, so now they're just going to go after the enterprise because that's where the money's at, right? Yep. And they're just cutting loose all of these smaller businesses and smaller startups that they'd started out on this banking product. And they're just shutting down their accounts. And basically, they, they all, a lot of people, we don't know how many, but enough where it created like a trend on Twitter, got an email from Brex saying, we're shutting down your account in two months. You got to move off of it. And that can be hugely disruptive to lose your banking partner as a small business like that quickly. And now you got to move everything around. What if you've got incoming deposits that now you've got to reroute? If that account is closed, are you going to get your money ever? Or, or anyway. you're an accountant that put clients on us and now the clients yeah. don't have a bank. Like Again, this ties back to this. Like This is why accountants are skeptical about software. Well, and, they're and, they're going to be slow to adopt. Yeah. And the question is, you know, how much did Brex spend to get these customers to? Because they were giving out something like 100,000 points. They had this point system, oh, yeah. which, you know, that ends up being worth by a thousand bucks. So they were basically paying like a thousand bucks to get you to sign up for a bank account with them. And then maybe there wasn't a lot of activity. They end up. This is a problem in general with a lot of these startups, right? You take VC money, they're these huge ad campaigns. You know, some of these startups that are, are spending a thousand to two thousand dollars to get an accountant onto their platform. Yeah. Right. And if you're, cost of acquisition is that, and you have a free product, it doesn't really work out. And then you're out of money, then you go out of business. So it's going to, and it made sense because even with, I remember with Melio early on, like people were very, like accounts, the question they always ask, like, how can you be free? Like, how are you going to stay in business? Now, Melio has a fee structure, but like, that's a big question. It's a concern. It's a valid concern because you can't put your clients on products that vanish. You just can't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or or worse than that, they they pivot like this, which is really yeah. bad. So if your clients got purged by Brex, I would recommend Relay Financial. I have a relationship with Relay Financial. I'm their accountant community advocate. So I have uh, I have my own opinions. Like, but I, I think they are the best solution. <laughs> as, as we run the podcast on it and I run my other business on it because PNC is horrible. Yeah. Like, yeah. We run, we run the cloud accounting podcast on Relay. It's easy to set up. Um, it's, the, it's the small business banking solution in the cloud. And I think every accountant will love the features they have. And they, they are really investing in the accountant channel. They've built a dashboard where you can see all your clients. You can manage all the permissions. It's not just a marketing thing. It's a real thing for accountants. It's a real partner program. Oh, and we just launched our certification, which I, uh, I'm the voice of the certification. So you can go and get it. I think it's about two hours and you can become a relay partner, certified partner, and get a badge to put on your website. And we're going to look into adding a CPE to that as well. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by A2X. Since 2014, A2X has helped thousands of online merchants and their advisors save inordinate amounts of time reconciling the revenue for their online stores. A2X posts tidy summaries of sales, returns, and fees from Shopify and Amazon directly into QuickBooks or Xero that exactly match the deposits that appear in the bank account, allowing you to accurately reconcile in just one click, giving you the confidence of knowing that your client's e-commerce financials are accurate. Cloud Accounting Podcast listener and e-commerce expert Scott Sharf said A2X is the gold standard in e-commerce accounting. ATX has a partner program for accountants and bookkeepers that includes one-on-one -on -one onboarding, training for you and your team, and exclusive marketing opportunities. To learn more about using ATX and get 50% off your subscription for three months by using code CAP50, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash A2X. 
That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash A, the number two, X. So just uh, other avenues to pivot just to go off of that, that is related to this expense card type thing or new banks. So there's, uh, we may have talked about them in the past. There's a small business, like one of these neo banks called Lily, L-I-L-I. Lily. Lily. Well, they just debuted a new app center. So now you can take this bank and connect it to your accounting software platforms, other payments apps, marketplaces like Etsy. Um, they, and they upgraded and uh, made their invoicing software more robust. So you can customize the invoices. So this is an online bank, right? Going after those, like it's that, the first thing people need to do is launch, get a bank, right? And now the invoicing's there. You know, everybody wants to be the t- full tech stack. And we've talked about this before. And they've just really made this a lot more robust. So, you know, the march is, there, there's options out there. You know, for small business. We got two voicemails that are related to app news. I want to play the first one now. This is from Heather Smith in response to our coverage of Data Deer. Data Deer is shutting down for non like who are they? So so Data they got Deer acquired. had like a Excel reporting thing that synced with QuickBooks and Zero. Right. And there's been other, there's other products. I think LiveFlow is out there. G A Genius Sheets. Uh, what's yep. the other one? Genius Sheets. Genius Sheets, right? So there's a couple of products okay. that do this. And Data Deer got acquired by Intuit. Intuit rolled it up because that's what they're doing right now. They're buying companies and rolling that software into QuickBooks Online Advanced. And through this journey now, they've, they're disabling access. Access to it. For and, non-QBO A users, yes. right? So, so Heather is doing a public service and has been looking into some alternatives. So let's hear from okay. Heather Smith, our Australian correspondent, <laughs> on uh, on her opinions on what we should look into. Hi, David and Blake. This is Heather Smith here, your favorite Australian roving reporter for the Cloud Accounting Podcast here. So as you've mentioned on previous episodes, of uh, the Cloud Accounting Podcast, Data Dare will soon no longer be available to users outside of QuickBooks Online. So I've spoken to the Intuit and the Data Dare team about it. And as I, again, I think you've mentioned, the solution will be built into QuickBooks Online. So it will no longer be available to external users. So I guess if you are on QBO, it's business as usual. And you actually get an additional solution there if additional features and functionality there um, if you so wish to use it. But if you're not using QBO, well then, um, and you still want to use Data Deer, well maybe you can move all of your accounting software across to QBO or um, you could change from Data Deer to another app in the market. So I wanted to quickly give you, just run through a, a few apps out there, a few options. So we have G-Acon, based out of Michigan, founded by Andrei Kostarnikov. Uh, G-Acon connects Zero, QuickBooks and FreshBooks with Google Sheets. And you can find that at um, accon.services. Um, another solution is Reach Reporting, based out of Utah, connects Zero and Gusto with Google Sheets. Find that at Reach Reporting. Um, then another solution is Flex Financial Reporting, based out of Perth, founded by Rory McCarran. Um, it used to be called QuickWin Developments, and it connects Zero directly to Microsoft Excel. Find that at flexfinancialreporting.com. And then a new player on the market, EXL Cloud, based out of Melbourne, founded by Lance Rubin. He's developing a solution that connects Xero with Microsoft Excel. It's currently in beta and you can access it at exlcloud.io. So hopefully that all makes sense. Um, And you can find um, verified accounting tools on the Xero marketplace. So this um, sort of functionality actually counts as a tool. So search for accountant tools 
on the Xero Marketplace or on the Marketplace of the accounting um, software package that you're using. So I've um, worked with a number of those solutions and they all work very well. Um, and I was strategically partnered with Datadare for many years and I'm currently strategically partnered with GACon. So hopefully that's useful information for everyone um, out there. Thank you, Blake and David, for such a brilliant and informative podcast. Wow. The, the, our Thank job's you, done. Heather. We can just roll up now. <laughs> I know. That was great. We got to make this a, a regular segment. Super in-depth. Uh, yeah. I think these these tools that are all cropping up are so cool. Being able to just pull your Zero or QBO data into a spreadsheet and then do what you want with it and keep it up to date automatically without having to export and cut and paste. You know, this and obviously, is, Intuit gets that value. That's where they, they bought it. But the lesson here is, again, yeah. here's another app getting shut down. So you, you, yep. you commit to something and then you get divorced or broken up with maybe, right? In, in a way you didn't yeah. want to. And so that leads me right to our next story, Blake. Next. Internet Explorer shutting down? No. Well, that's a whole, I, don't, I didn't want to touch that story because I saw somebody post on Facebook because Internet Explorer used to be embedded in QuickBooks desktop. And there was a Facebook, I was like, I'm not even bringing this to the show. <laughs> like, like, well, the desktop people are worried about Internet Explorer. I'm like, it's the double, triple whammy. I don't want to talk about well, that. Well, I wonder, I don't know the answer to this, but Internet Explorer is shutting down. And I know that the way that you exported data from QuickBooks Desktop to online was through Explorer. Internet Explorer was the only way you could yeah. do it. And, and, I, and I think have, they moved they... away from that. Okay. A, a while back, but it was just, I just, like, oh man, I don't want to go down that path. But we're still going to speak about Intuit. So, well, but wait, can I just reminisce with you about Internet Explorer? Okay. For a minute? Oh, I, okay. I didn't this, know this, this is the end of an era, an David. Era. Era, an era. Now, now, do you know when Internet Explorer was released? I was working at the mall, so this had to be 94, 95, 95 maybe? Yep, you're right. August 16th, 1995. Waterfalls by TLC was the number one song in the country. <laughs> Bill Clinton was in the White House. And Microsoft introduced a new way to surf the web, Internet Explorer. That's the lead of a New York Times article all about this nostalgia. Yeah, we were, you you would Explorer. buy a mosaic box or you'd buy the Internet Explorer box and take it home yeah. to install your browser. <laughs> well, what's funny about it is that it was around for so long and it was the default browser. But from the beginning, people said it's buggy and slow. And it really never shook that, right? It was always the browser that your mom used or that you had to use at work because it was the only one that was secure. Well, a lot of engineers would code to it. And that's why this is my big problem of a lot of apps. You use apps. They only work with Google now, Google Chrome. This is the same yeah. dance over again. Like, like apps like, well, you have to use Google Chrome to use our app. I'm like, that's just going to put us in the same boat. You're just the new Microsoft Explorer, i.e. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, the solution is, it's, it's actually kind of funny to think that most of the time when we work in a cloud environment, we're working in a Chrome browser and we have 200 tabs open. And that is what's actually pushing our computers to the max these days. Most people, they got to upgrade their computer just to handle the tabs. The browser, right? The, it's yeah, the browser. because, you know, and browser apps are like, if they're really resource inten intensive, they're not as efficient as a native application. But that's just, it's the world we live in now, right? Well, that's because you always have some tab open and it's playing six autoplay videos you didn't even know were running. <laughs> it's just, it, you, I always know to go check when I start hearing my laptop, the fan just going crazy. Yeah. Like, I'm like, what? Ooh, this, this app just decided to play these videos on their landing page. Uh, so we're well, we getting, you know, what's sad about Internet Explorer, what was sad about it is it, it ended Netscape Navigator. You know, they basically became that default and it was also the reason don't forget that uh, Microsoft ended up in the crosshairs of regulators for antitrust because they were bundling Internet Explorer as the default browser in Windows. Well, beyond that, and I can even take this deeper in. So partially the reason, I mean, this is a little skip speculation here, but so maybe yeah. was that Intuit at the time? Remember when you first used to install Windows? Early on when they released uh, Windows 98, I would think it was, that's mm -hmm. when they really started embedding IE in there. And on the desktop, they would put some icons. One was to Disney.com or ABC Go, or whatever the hell it was called, Go.com at the time. There was a mm -hmm. desktop icon, a shortcut to Quicken. So there's probably a little swapping. All right, we'll make, so Intuit, if you make IE your official default browser and all your apps, we'll put mm -hmm. your icon on our desktop. 
I'm sure there's some back scratching there. So it does tie full, like the IE story, you can't tell without the Intuit journey. They are very deeply tied together, those two products and always have. Well, been. David, thank, thank you for going down memory, <laughs> memory lane with me. I'll, I'll let you get back on track. All right. So we'll go back a couple memories ago. Um, I want to say about eight months ago, we actually titled our, our episode that thousands of apps are going to lose access to QuickBooks online data. Remind me why. Um, Intuit has requirements for apps. And there's two tiers of that. There's like this basic set of requirements. So if you have an app and you're going to have, it's a custom app, maybe you have three customers, you're never going on the app store. Why do you need to jump through a bunch of extra hoops to get on? If you're not going to be on the app store, right? It, it costs Intuit time and money to research your app and vet okay. your app out. If nobody's using it, it's a custom app, whatever. So they base, basically have decided to change those requirements to where everybody has to jump through the hard requirements now. And so if you think about the thousands of developers, I mean, you have, what, 750 apps, or maybe it's probably 1,000, 1,000 apps in the App Store by now for QuickBooks Online. You probably have another 4,000 to 5,000 apps that are probably connecting through the APIs, right? So that's a lot of, some of it's teeny yeah. small apps, some of it's one-offs. And now all of them have to meet the new requirements. And they've started to do this transition. And they've already transitioned. So if you're an app not meeting these requirements, you can't take new customers onto your API connection. But the big shutdowns come in the end of July. So now we're you know six weeks out or whatever for July mm. 31st. And I just wanted to check the status of it because I did hear rumbling from an accountant who's like, oh, we just had to fix something yesterday because we got turned off. And there's valid questions on this, right? I, you know, I, yeah. I asked Intuit developer, you know, how, what's the status? Is it still on track? Are they still shutting it down? And the response I got was, yes, they're going to limit the ability, right? But existing users. So if you have a connection already on that app, your API, you're not going to be turned off, which is good. But then it opens the door to like, what if somebody connects and disconnects and reconnects, right? Um, and then it'd be great to get the list, right? How many numbers, how many app developers have migrated to these new policies? How many haven't? Because apps are going to shut down. I, I truly believe this is going to happen. Wow. There's going to be issues because you don't have access to the API and, and just another thing, right? Being turned off that you don't have control on as a firm. And it's, these are the things that burn bridges. And then you wonder why accountants are like, I only want to use desktop because nobody can turn it off once I buy it and install it on my hard drive, right? Like that's, this is the, our behaviors as an industry cause other people's behaviors as an industry. And now there is a developer that piped in that said it was, you know, they wanted to update their app card prior to, but they were already going to be on the app store. So it doesn't really matter. It's really the people with those custom integrations and those smaller apps that aren't on the app store. That's, I think, where the risk is. So if you have clients that are using an app that connects to QuickBooks Online, make sure you're preparing for things and make sure your decks are in order for this. And, and which kind of ties to a bigger discussion where it's like, you know, Intuit Dev's doing this, right? They're shutting down this API if you don't meet the qualifications. In the meantime, Zero's charging developers on their app store, right? So then what happens? What if an app developer's like, screw you, Zero. I don't want you to pay your little fee to be on your app store. And then now that app's API connection gets turned off. Who knows, right? Like this is just... I think it's very short-sighted thinking instead of this long-term victory, which is open APIs, everybody. And I see this pendulum swing a lot and it always has, you know, in this industry. I remember like back in the day, if you had QuickBooks desktop and ADP, you could be a very good customer of both products, but you pay, paid a penalty. You had to like export your file out, then you put it on your desktop, then import it into QuickBooks. Then next week, take the file from ADP, import it into QuickBooks. And it was very mistake prone. It's dangerous. Like all those old ways of doing things are bad. APIs are great, but these companies are getting, I don't know, they, they, they're going to they're gonna burn bridges with accountants. It doesn't help any of us long-term shutting off APIs, charging developers a little extra premiums for a short-term victory. It doesn't really help all of us. Um, we will see. I agree. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Canopy. Accounting practices management software should bring together all of your firm's mission-critical functions in one place. Client management, document management, workflow, time and billing, and payments to keep your team organized. 
Canopy knows that not all firms are on the same practice management journey or timeline, so Canopy lets you build your practice management platform as you need it. You start with the client management as your foundation, then you can choose the modules that your firm needs. Since nobody likes paying for modules they don't use, they offer modular pricing as well. Canopy integrates with QuickBooks Online, Xero, FreshBooks, CRMs, Form Builders, Spreadsheets, Calendars, Email, and Zapier. They have a mobile app, centralized file management, fillable PDFs, a client portal, task management, and the list goes on and on. Via their integration with the IRS, you can easily retrieve all your clients' transcripts, notices, and child care tax credit payments without leaving Canopy. To try Canopy free for 30 days, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash Canopy. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash C-A-N-O-P-Y. It's time to streamline your firm with Canopy. So continuing on in app news, Fathom now has an integration with Google Sheets. We could even talk about Fathom having, <laughs> they got pulled out of, they're getting pulled out of one of the Intuit offerings. There's another, you're committed, you're onto oh, something that gets pu- pulled out. Yeah, we talked so about f- this a couple weeks ago, but. Yeah, QuickBooks Online Advanced had Fathom as the built-in uh, forecasting tool. And was it an online advanced tool. or was it the accountant's edition? I, I thought it was online advanced. I thought everything's I going it's into advanced. because they both are called QBOA. It's so dumb. <laughs> well, call so they the got, other one enterprise. <laughs> they got pulled out of that and Centage got put in, yes. which doesn't surprise me because, you know, Fathom's really more of like a dashboarding tool. It's not really a forecasting tool, whereas Centage is an actual like FP&A, full FP&A, budgeting, forecasting, BVA application. Yeah. But you know, what I want to point out about this integration with Google Sheets that's really nice is that now you can bring in your non-financial data into Fathom, which is something I used to do for a client, and I had to do it manually every week or every month. And now you can just set up the columns and the rows in a Google Sheet, have somebody go update that with your non-financial information, and that gets pulled in automatically to your Fathom dashboard. So that's a really nice feature. I, I think it took that's a long time. That's a value time. add, right, for your clients. If you, you're like, hey, yeah. I mean, this dashboard, but oh, you want to know the weather because you're an ice cream shop and you see the weather each day, you can. And then- yeah, I mean, financial dashboards that only have financial data are useless, in my opinion. I am willing to go out on a limb there. I am willing to stake, put a stake in the ground on that. It's totally pointless if all you have are these lagging indicators of financial information. Your clients will never look at it. You have to find out about their business, learn about their business, learn about what operational metrics matter to them. Is it orders? Is it phone calls? Is it leads? Is it properties under management? Is it patient seen? Is it whatever it is for their type of business? You got to so get usually that Usually that's in. the data they're using to make decisions anyways. Yeah, that's that's the leading indicators, yeah, right? They're not making that, decisions based on debt to equity ratio. <laughs> like they're not making any business decisions based on that. No, no, the current current ratio, like, yeah. you know, who cares? Like in, an, you know, in a small business, it's all cash flow, right? And you need to have the metrics that lead to cash, cash coming in the door. And so if you have a SaaS company, right? We, I've talked about this in my technology talks for years now. Like, and, and we've actually got a voicemail about this from Byron Patrick. So maybe this would be a good time to get to that. You know, I think that FASB, if it really wants to make accounting more useful, accounting standards more useful, should standardize these KPIs that we use in all these different industries, especially in subscription businesses and technology companies, because we've got this whole methodology for calculating all these different metrics, but it's not standard. And every company does it in a slightly different way. And when you're doing due diligence on these companies, it can be a real challenge to figure out what is actually going on. Yeah, Stuff as basic as like whether or not you include gross profit in your calculation of lifetime value, or if you're just going on revenue, there's actually that a difference in that in the way different companies calculate it. And it makes a huge difference uh, in your, in your numbers. So shall we hear from Byron? Jump in. Hey, Blake and David, Byron Patrick from Field Guide here. Just listened to this past week's episode and Blake, you know, I say this with love. Sometimes I'd like to just get to app news, but this week, not so much. I really enjoyed your perspective regarding the metrics and KPIs of businesses and the idea of auditing those metrics. I really think about it, especially with SaaS organizations, the use of many of these metrics, everything from, you know, cost of customers, 
to churn rates, number of clients, number of users, et cetera. A lot of these things get presented to investors, potential buyers, used in marketing information and beyond. And frankly, you know, there's fuzziness around a lot of those metrics, the way they are measured, the way they are presented, et cetera. And the idea that auditors could participate in uh, confirming the confidence or integrity of those numbers, I think makes a lot of sense. And to your point really is aligned with the origin of the financial statement audit and creating confidence in numbers that, you know, outsiders don't necessarily have visibility into, but need a third party to create some confidence. So just great topic, great thought. I, I think it's something that really kind of has me challenged thinking about the application of the audit and, uh, always appreciate the perspective. So great catching up, uh, this prior week at engage. Good seeing you both look forward to seeing you all again soon. Keep up the good work. Thanks. Thank you, Byron. It was great to see you as well. And thank you for that note. And I think yeah, that was like, our conclusion last week that if you just be really good at audit, you might have a real business model there. You know, like why, why, why don't auditors audit? Like uh, maybe they do, but I, there's no standard on what is a subscriber and wh why, why don't we have all subscription businesses reporting their number of subscribers, their churn, their lifetime value. This would be information that I, as an investor would really like to have in deciding whether or not to buy Netflix stock, for instance, or Disney stock or any of these businesses or Adobe, right? Any of these businesses that have turned into subscription businesses, they kind of just choose, right? Like, like Intuit decided to just stop releasing numbers on their number of QuickBooks Online subscribers one day. Yeah. Right? Because maybe no longer benefited them to do so because the number was slowing or something. But we don't know, right? Because there's no, there's no rules around this. You can do whatever you want when it comes to those non-financial numbers. You choose what to present. And the non-financial stuff for these subscription businesses ends up being more important than the Gap numbers because Gap isn't really good at describing a subscription business. More app so, news? I, I got more, actually. I, I mean, and that's what Byron's going to love it because we have lots of app news. It's almost a whole episode. But I do have a quick, just a touch on EY and audit. This but, counts. This counts as app news, right? Yeah, it counts. Because they're going to invest in audit. They're going to put a billion technology. dollars into an audit app. Audit yes. technology. Now, I read their press release, and I'm just going to rewind. You know, like, remember, I don't even know who it was from the big four. They built, they were working on with some of the states that all these contracts to build their COVID appointment software. And then, you know, it California is getting advised by different parts of the different big four companies to build out their big, huge California ERP system that's now taken, you know, 20 a decade. years. And I think yeah. in Canada, there's some payroll system or something that they're getting consulted on by like IBM's advising group. And it just never, these things are happening. So to me, I read this press release and it sounds like EY's advising division sold a billion dollar contract to, <laughs> to the audit division. So here's, here's the, the quote uh, from the press release. The investment will support the integration of existing EY assurance technologies into one seamless platform that combines the strengths of the organization's leading class global audit platforms and leverages advanced technologies from EY alliance partners to power a new generation of data-driven assurance services. Like This is the type of stuff the advisory division sells to corporations all over the, all the time, like that kind of verbiage. We're going to take all your systems and make a super system. And then they get into a 10 year contract for a billion dollars. It sounds like they basically EY, <laughs> the audit division just got sold a billion dollar contract, which now think about this. What if they do split, right? This is a way for yeah. the advisory the division to get some, the consulting division well, to get some money. The auditors have to do something because the whole audit business model has been founded on getting recent college graduates to come in and very cheaply do a lot of labor. It's very human intensive, human capital intensive. Not a lot of technology has historically been applied to audits. It's been very manual. And with the supply of fresh graduates drying up because of the demographic shifts that have happened, fewer people becoming CPAs, fewer people interested in becoming auditors when salaries have stagnated for years and years. The only way that we're going to solve this problem is with technology. So they really need to make this investment. 
And there was just a story, an opinion piece in Going Concerned by Robert Conway, who is a former retired Big Four audit partner and former leader of a PCAOB regional office. He's the author of the book, The Truth About Public Accounting. He just wrote an article in Going Concern a week or two ago, the audit profession's inability to retain talent poses a serious threat to audit quality. So because they haven't been making these investments, they've just been using people, they don't have the tech to like do high quality audits without a lot of people. And it's going to make their audit division less valuable. Yeah. Well, and this goes back to the, you know, our discussion in the previous episode that, you know, like if, if, if something doesn't happen, we're going to have serious threat of audit failure in the United States, like we've seen in the UK and we've seen elsewhere. I, I, it's just hard to imagine how these audits are being done in a, like, it's just hard to see how, when you've got fewer people every year, you can do a high quality audit if you've been doing it the same way every year. So. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Cinder. Tax season is over, which means you can focus on growing your business rather than hustling to handle the clients you've already got. But how do you add new clients when you're already so busy? That's easy with Cinder. With Cinder, you can automate mundane tasks like reconciliation and categorization and instead spend more time on strategy. Thanks to Cinder's new e-commerce insights, you become a trusted advisor to your clients, not just a data entry clerk. Give them important tools to know their numbers and make the right decisions to grow their business. Over 2,000 CPAs are already future-proofing their business with Cinder as their secret solution. Ready to join them? To book your free demo, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash Cinder. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash S-Y-N-D-E-R. Other app news. What's the big battle you, when you had your bookkeeping business and you talked to a sole proprietor, what's one of the biggest battles you have with them? Like a prospect that I'm talking to or, well, well, or like, somebody? They're your, they're your client. These sole proprietors. Like, I'm, I think one of the big battles is you can't get them to separate their business from their personal expenses. They commingle oh, yeah. everything. They right? commingle. It's, it's kind of a big, big thing. So the new app is out there. It's a fintech app called Nula, N-U-U-L-A. And the headline is they're talking about how they're launching in Canada. So they're a Toronto company and they've been launched already in other markets, but now they're finally launching in their home market. But what's interesting about this app, they call it a super app. And it allows small businesses to track their cash flow, monitor critical financial and commercial metrics, and then bring in like your online ratings and reviews. But not only that, it allows you to buy personal and business insurance, loans for personal things, smart credit cards, integrated wealth management. So it's like an app that's commingling everything back together again. Oh, great. That's exactly what we need as accountants. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know where to go from here. We could talk about the Google AI engineer who claimed that the AI is sentient, or we could talk about cryptocurrency. Let's, uh, let me cover uh, one more app news here. Okay. Uh, Decimal. So Decimal is a technology platform for small businesses. Um, accounting operations, they announced a $9.2 million seed round. Um, it's again, it's another accounting firm with engineers. So what's their decimal is the name? Decimal. Decimal. Uh, what, what, what's com. their website? Decimal.com. Decimal. Oh, decimal. they must have paid a lot for that. All right. Let's take a look at it. Accounting firm with engineers. And while you're doing that, they launched in January of 2020 and they've uh, just been growing for two years with no, by raising no capital at this point. Huh. You didn't start your business to do accounting. Get back to running your company. Decimal is accounting operations for small business, bookkeeping, technology setup, slash support, bill pay, payroll, and more. And they start at $500 per month. And then they have examples of different types of companies that pay. Here's a thousand. Here's $2,750. Who founded this? Let's see. Leadership team. Matt Tate is the CEO and Jacob Cloran is the CEO. I didn't oh, recognize oh. when I poked around a little. So, yeah, this is it's an interesting way to present an accounting firm. Like from a marketing standpoint, right? It doesn't look like an accounting firm when you go to this web- website, decimal.com. It looks like a tech company. And which tricks me- the VCs too. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think it's a good way to present your firm because the big difference between I would say a modern accounting services firm and a traditional firm is traditional firms are focused on the partner relationship with the client and that personal relationship. 
And the, the modern corporate model of doing this is based on the brand relationship with the customer. So that's what you want. If you want to build a firm that you can sell someday, you don't want it to have your name on it. And you don't want the clients to have a personal relationship with you. Yeah. And that separation that's that, there. And, and that's, that's something that you, if like you need to decide early on when you're building your firm, because that affects all the branding and it affects the way that you build the firm. Like you don't, you don't want to be doing the work. So like I built a firm years ago where by the end of my five year journey, I didn't talk to any clients when it came to the sales process. I had a salesperson. I didn't onboard any of the clients. I didn't do any of the work for the clients. I just managed the team and the team collectively delivered the final product. And that, is easy to sell because it doesn't rely on you, the owner, doing the work. All you do is add in some AI, Blake, and you'd been rich. I know, right? You could have got that in your pitch deck. <laughs> Should have gone out and raised some money uh, from a VC for that, I, right? I have but... two 10-second app news that's going to tie you right into your crypto. Okay, cool. Right. So two apps, uh, Legible, they closed a $20 million Series A round. And then another app that's similar, Cryptio, they raised $10 million to make crypto accounting easier. So both these apps essentially connect all your wallets and help summarize tax mm -hmm. gains and losses for accounts and bookkeepers. So that's and thank it you for app news. I think I'm done. <laughs> and thank you to Mike, today. Mike Doan for sending us the info. At least he sent me the info on Cryptio, you know, which is one of these apps that like sends, that you, you plug all your wallets into and then it, it figures out the calculations for the gains and the losses that you got to do for tax purposes. So thanks for that. All right, so let's talk about crypto. Uh, you know, we didn't talk about it really in the last episode, but there's been uh, a crypto crash, a big crypto crash, a loss of the numbers keep changing because it keeps going down further. But like one point five trillion dollars in value has disappeared. Pulling out my from, fancy cash app here. Yeah. How's your ten dollar investment in crypto or Bitcoin doing right now, David? You did it all in Bitcoin, right? Was it? Um. Yeah, Bitcoin, and I did it through the uh, Cash App. I think I did some through PayPal and Venmo too, but very small, ten dollars. Yeah. But then on Monday, I bought even more. So right now, I'm at I'm down again. So it's so nine dollars and fifty seven cents, and it was and down to total... five fifty five, and I I doubled it. So I invested oh. at the beginning of the week another five fifty five because people are saying this is the time you got to buy low, mm -hmm. so high. So I doubled my position on Monday, and I'm down already. So. so there's a lot, there's a lot that's been going on. You know, I think this, the whole crypto crash was set off by the collapse really of the um, Terra stablecoin and Luna, which was related to it. And it's these algorithmic stablecoins that have fundamental issues with, you know, not being able to be stable and, and that set off this whole thing. But it's, but it's not just that, it's the economy's changed. And all of a sudden people who had play money and they're goofing around with crypto are realizing it's not real, a real sustainable thing and they're pulling their money out. Yeah, well, and to me, what it indicates is this, is that like Bitcoin and Ether and crypto as a store of value has not been, has been disproven at this point. You know, maybe, yes, maybe someday it could become that, but it's not digital gold. If it was digital gold, it would not be acting like this. When the stock market is going down, assets, hard assets like gold, stay steady or go up. And so it's proving that, a good chunk of the people that were in this market were in it to speculate, right? And you know, we saw you, you see this. It's it's sometimes called the greater fool theory, and that's what Bill Gates said when he was speaking at a TechCrunch talk on climate change on Tuesday. He described the phenomenon as something that's quote one hundred percent based on greater fool theory, unquote, re referring to the idea that overvalued assets will go up in price when there are enough investors willing to pay more for them. Right, so there's nothing like fundamental to cryptocurrency that gives it value. It's it's based on less than even stock prices, right? It doesn't make a product, and it doesn't typically give you a return. But there there are ways that people have been earning returns, and this is what's crazy is that uh, Celsius, which is like a bank for cryptocurrency that was paying a return to investors, has shut down withdrawals. Like something like, uh, I want to say $11.8 billion in customer assets based on the company's May report are now frozen. And, and, and it's turning and, out, they're starting to surface like 
founders, certain insiders are getting able to get out. Like this is, this is, people are going to go to jail for this stuff. It's crazy. Well, so, so that is the question is, will, maybe nobody will go to jail because it's not like this stuff's regulated and, you know, it's not, we don't know. Are they, are the, are crypto exchanges, are uh, cryptocurrency, c- cryptocurrency securities, the SEC has waffled on this and has failed to regulate it. And companies like Celsius, which act like banks, are not regulated. And so if you invest in them, if you put money into these accounts, if they go out of business, you're just another unsecured creditor. You know, it's not like FDIC insurance for banks and yeah. people so that's are getting- So they were saying, if it's under 100,000, go file small claims court things right now before they declare I, bankruptcy. There's a, yeah, there's a lot with this. And and it's crazy. After we left Vegas that um, for ASCPA Engage, I'm in the taxi cab. The taxi cab driver's all like, blah, 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 blah. You got to buy crypto. I and mean, he's so confident and <laughs> like to the moon, you know, all that crypto bro talk. And yeah. He's, and he's like, I get so many tips, you know, because, and, and yeah, of course, because all the crypto bros who are gambling, they also gamble when they're in Vegas. It's like, they're all the same kind of personality. So they in the car and they like to brag how much they made on crypto, which is the same way people that gamble a lot tell you how much money they won when they never yeah. tell you about how much they lose. And it's that same game. It, 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 there's really, it makes sense why taxi cab drivers in Vegas are all pro crypto, <laughs> trying to convince you in the car that, you know, arguing with, it wasn't arguing with me. It was just, I was trying not to participate, but this guy was all in, man. He's going to be so yeah. rich from crypto. I'm like, dude, I'm, I don't know. So, so the way Celsius worked is interesting. If you're a customer, you would lend money to Celsius. You deposit money for, to Celsius in exchange for yield. So unlike a cryptocurrency investment, which gives you no yield, Celsius was promising you a yield. And they would take your money and then put those deposits in decentralized finance investments and lend out the funds to other users. And the yields were like spectacular, up to 18.6% on cryptocurrency deposits, which just hearing that makes me think that's totally ridiculous, right? Like that's not sustainable. It's it, it, That sounds like a Ponzi scheme right there, right? To to offer that kind of return. And that's the sort of returns that you know people who create those schemes would promise people. And, and basically when the market collapsed, Celsius, you know, couldn't, it couldn't get its money out. And so the customers, the depositors, the ones who end up getting screwed. And it's just like, it's just, it's like the wildcat banking period in the United States in the 19th century, all over again. But and the then, regulators at have least just you could ab- take some of ab- that money and maybe buy a good and service. It's amazing, like talking to like people jumped on me on Twitter because these they defend Bitcoin. I'm like, well, what have you ever bought with Bitcoin? Well, I've never actually purchased anything with it. It's like, right. Like, it's, and that's it's the not thing a st- is like, at least I've done that. I, I have micro payments in a podcast app and I send to another podcaster. Like I'm, u- I'm utilizing Bitcoin for what in theory it sh- should be for yeah. like micro payments. You can send money. I'm not, buy- I don't have it as an investment thing, but the fact that people are, they're so gung ho about it and they've never actually used it as a transaction is bananas to me. So here's the good news about this whole collapse is that it might. <laughs> the good news. Well, it might finally result in regulation because what usually happens when people lose a lot of money is the lawyers come out and do class action lawsuits because there's a lot of money that was lost. There's a lot of small investors and you could create that and try to get something back from these VCs, from these founders that created these assets in the first place and who timed it so they got out before the collapse, or they got a ch- good chunk of their money out, right? And and so that is the theory of an article in the Wall Street Journal I read called Who Pays for Crypto's Collapse? And so that's the idea is, you know, the SEC has failed to regulate these, maybe lawsuits will make it happen, or maybe political pressure now will make it finally happen. The problem is that the people who are supposed to be regulating cryptocurrency are often invested in cryptocurrency and so they have these ma- they have conflicts of interest and there's nothing in the law that prevents politicians in congress from investing in the same products that they're supposed to be regulating and there was this crazy exchange on television that I have to play for you it was uh, senator Cynthia Loomis talking and where's about she from Fide- Let's Senator see. Loomis, um, she is, she's a Republican from Wyoming. Gotcha. And there's this bipartisan group. She appeared on TV. I'll just, I'm going to play this clip from for you, okay, from her TV appearance. She's talking about 
Fidelity's plan to allow their people to uh, allow their customers to invest up to 20% of their retirement funds into cryptocurrency, which I think is just nuts. But anyway, here we go. Fidelity, the largest 401k manager in the country, um, announced that they were going to offer uh, Bitcoin uh, to users or to consumers. Uh, companies have to choose to allow uh, their employees to put Bitcoin in their 401ks. Uh, the Labor Department came out and said, this is a terrible idea. What do you think? I think the Labor Department's wrong. Uh, I think it's a wonderful idea. It should be part of a diversified asset allocation, and it should be on the end of the spectrum of a store of value. Obviously, if you have a fully diversified asset allocation, you have some assets that you want to produce income in the short run. You also want some assets uh, that are just a store of value. Uh, and I think that's where Bitcoin really shines. I think it's some of the hardest money that's ever been created in, in the world. Uh, and for that reason, it belongs as a slice of a diversified asset allocation for retirement funds. Senator Gillibrand, you agree, disagree? No, I agree. So this is why when you vote people, every incumbent, vote them out of office. Like nobody, they're all idiots. They don't deserve to be there. None of them across the aisle, vote every single person out. Like we can just be placed with other idiots, which is better than the idiots that are there. So like just vote everybody out. Like, it, like they don't deserve to be there. None of them. Senator Loomis is on the committee in the Senate that's supposed to be regulating cryptocurrency and blockchain and all that. And she disclosed that she purchased somewhere between $100,000 and $350,000 in Bitcoin. It's nice to have that disposable income. And here she is talking about it. Here she is talking about it as the hardest money that has ever been created. And meanwhile, it's collapsing. I mean, <laughs> it's not. You know, well, she has to talk it up. This is the exact same on Twitter. Sean Stein yeah. Smith, Dr. Sean Stein Smith, PhD, CPA. He just got some major award from AIS, AICPA. He's been like the crypto expert in our space, does talks all over the country, state societies. But really, if you start listening to it, he's pumping crypto. And now yeah. crypto's down. I tweeted at him on, you know, Monday, like, what should I do? You know, he's like, oh, buy. He, he's 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 in the same boat. Oh, this is an opportunity. The the game here is to buy low and sell high, like as in buy more. Right? Yeah. It's it's and then I asked him, well, are you going to tell me when to sell? So I created a Twitter search that use tracks the word sell or sold, so I can see if he ever sells, and on the when to sell. Like when when are we at the top? When do you sell? Yeah. You know the Chinese rising global power banned cryptocurrency and created their own state run cryptocurrency like we should i think and and they're not dealing with this crap letting this go on further it's a humongous mistake and and it's just going to hurt small investors and it could lead to instability in our financial markets when you have all these wildcat crypto banks and uh you know i th i think it could be the next cause of the next recession maybe not this time it won't be a big deal but like if if nothing happens if regulation doesn't happen and these unregulated banks are allowed to continue to exist they could values could pump up again and then we could have another collapse well do you remember that company microstrategy they yeah they, um, they bought billions of bitcoin to put on their balance sheet right it's like a hedge well because of the crash their company lost had its own crash so the bitcoin crash on Monday caused their stock to drop 25%. Now, if they mm -hmm. didn't have this ridiculous investment in Bitcoin, their stock would not have fallen 25% in one day. Yeah. So, so it's starting to affect real companies' earnings. And the crazier thing is, let's go back to the beginning of the thing in startups. And there's a lot of startups and I've, that have taken VC money and then put some off to the side into crypto. Yeah, we're going to hear about a startup that fa that like a startup that has nothing to do with crypto that mismanaged their cash and spent put some into crypto, and that that app crashed. We're going to have it, it, I wouldn't be surprised if it's an app in our space. We'll be talking about that soon, where an app completely went under because they took VC money instead of investing it in the product, put it over here into Bitcoin. Should we get into the the reviews? Yeah, let's read those reviews. All right. So this first one's on Podchaser. It's a bit long, but I'll read this. It's a five-star review. 
It's from Heather77498. If you work in accounting and you're not having fun, you're, colon, one, working in the wrong place, two, not listening to these guys. I've listened to several podcasts, but I really look forward to this one the most each week. David and Blake provide a great blend of relevant and useful and entertaining information. This is what we all strive to give our clients. These guys offer us the same value. Really, anyone in any field would benefit from listening to them. Heather K., the executive geek. Thank you so much, Heather. It's amazing. Yeah, thank you. That that makes it all worthwhile. And that was on Podchaser, so you can go to podchaser.com and leave a review there. If you can, try to mention uh, working press in your review. <laughs> amazing press. Use words like that. That would be great. News and well, press. You know, you know I've, I, I've decided that um, when AICPA said that they only invite working press to their events, I think they meant they only invite press that work for them. Oh, okay. I get it now. This is the right? figure you decoded it. Got it. Yeah. Um, another review. This is on Apple Podcast. This is another five star review. The title of the review is Cloud Accounting in Canada. Great show, even though I am from Canada. Love to hear about all the apps out there. And this is from Debbie 1938. So thank you, Debbie. I, I'm glad we get some of the Canadian love as well. And Blake, I guess it's time to shut down. I got to pack. I got to head to Orlando. Yeah, me too. Great to see you, David. Uh, If listeners want to get to know you online, where can they follow you? I'm on all the socials, just at David Leary. I am at Blake T. Oliver on Twitter. You can email me, Blake at BlakeOliver.com. And let us know what you think about uh, this show, anything we've talked about on the show, anything you think we should talk about. Send us a voicemail. You can... Record that with your phone, email it to Blake at BlakeOliver.com. We will listen and we will likely play that on the air. And David, if you I'll want s- to get CPE credit for this, Blake, you haven't talked about yeah. Earmark in the last oh, yeah, two episodes. I, I know, I know. So Earmark is up to over 2,000 members who are earning free CPE for listening to the Cloud Accounting Podcast and many other amazing podcasts and YouTube videos. We take those episodes and videos, we wrap them in courses. You can get it on your mobile phone and earn CPE on the go. So I'm doing my laundry. I'm listening to the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I'm done. I whip out my phone. I pull up the Earmark app. I answer three questions. Boom, I get CPE credit. Technically five questions. Oh, five questions. You get the idea. It takes you like five minutes to get the CPE for the episode you've already listened to. So you're already at the end of this episode. Get free CPE for it. Download EarmarkCPE.com on the App Store or go to EarmarkCPE.com in your web browser to sign up. Uh, yeah, it's it's great. We're going to hopefully launch our subscription offering so our members can support the app, hopefully this month. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, Amazing. Going, it's going good. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Time for the classifieds. If you're looking to quickly grow a scalable, systematic seven-figure accounting firm without having to work 50 plus hours per week, check out Ryan Lozanis' online coaching membership, Future Firm Accelerate. Sign around Ryan's experience taking his cloud firm from scratch to sale so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You'll get online learning and topics that help you automate and systemize all aspects of your firm. You'll get coaching when you need help with implementation. And you'll also join a collaborative community of hundreds of other forward-thinking firm owners. For more details, head over to www.futurefirmaccelerate.com. Tired of clients not remembering to get W9s? Get W9 automates and streamlines the collection and storage of W9s. Get W9 has a QBO integration and they have a partner program that pays 25% commissions. Get W9 plans start at only $19 a year. Visit getw9.tax today to get started. That is getw9.tax. Are you looking for a dream job in cloud accounting? We have the job for you. Advisors for Change delivers cloud accounting systems to small and medium nonprofit organizations. Join our team of friendly and collaborative nonprofit accounting professionals while working from home. Our systems associate will join our experienced systems manager to implement and support cloud accounting systems such as QBO, Bill.com, Divi, Sassan, and others. To learn more, head to our website at advisorsforchange.com slash join dash our dash team. That's advisorsforchange.com slash join dash our dash team. We'll find a link to the full position description on Indeed. Are your bookkeeping clients driving you crazy asking the same questions over and over? They need QuickBooks training and you have more important things to do with your time. Let RoyalWise be your training partner. 
create your own customized client training program and outsource your QuickBooks training department. Listeners of this podcast are invited to join our partner program and receive a 10% referral commission when you sign up. Join us at royalwise.com slash partner to learn more and get started today. Again, that's royalwise.com slash partner. Are you a tech savvy accountant that knows how to lead a team and loves interacting with clients? Are you looking to grow from a controller or CFO into a leadership role? ResolveWorks is hiring a director of client accounting to lead our services team and be a key member of our firm leadership. We are a collaborative team serving entrepreneurs building fast growing startups. We are fully remote, offer flexible schedules and have a suite of attractive benefits. To learn more and submit your interest, visit resolve-works.com slash careers. That is resolve-works.com slash careers. Hey, podcast listeners, it's Blake, and I wanted to let you know about a new show I'm working on with CPA slash comedian Greg Kite and blogger slash former CPA Caleb Newquist. It's called Oh My Fraud, and it's a podcast all about financial crimes. That's right, a true crime podcast for accountants by accountants. Caleb and Greg are going to come together every couple weeks to unpack their favorite frauds and explore the circumstances, psychology, and interpersonal dynamics involved. They also fully indulge in victim blaming the defrauded widows, orphans, infirm, and feeble minded because who can resist? If you fancy yourself a trusted advisor or prefer your true crime with spreadsheets instead of corpses, listen to this show to learn what to watch out for and to keep your clients, your firm, and even yourself safe. To subscribe, go to ohmyfraud.com or search Oh My Fraud on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Want to get the word out about your newsletter, webinar, party, Facebook group, podcast, ebook, job posting, or that fancy Excel macro you just created? Why not let the listeners of the Cloud Accounting Podcast know by running a classified ad? Hit the show notes for the link to get more info.